I think we're ready to get started. I want to start by thanking everyone for being here. Thank you for coming to this event, which I think is going to be really interesting. And it's great to host the panelists as well as the authors of the Beyond the Pioneer report here today. I thought I'd take a few minutes to talk about Columbia Business School and the social enterprise program at Columbia Business School. So we have a really strong and robust social enterprise program, as the students here know. And through the course of their two years here, a number of students, I think a third of our students, are touched by and touch the social enterprise program in some way. This includes internships that they do, projects, as well as uh, courses that they take and uh, work that they generally do interning in organizations around the city. So it's a very robust program. There's a lot of student interest in social enterprise. And um, as you'll see today, um, Columbia Business School does pride itself on uh, being uh, very strong in this area. The program itself focuses on four areas, social entrepreneurship, international development, sustainability and the environment, and public and nonprofit management. Our students are interested in each of these and take up jobs in each of these sectors. Also, there's a student initiative called MyCrolumbia, which is a very strong initiative focusing on impact investing and pro bono consulting services. Along with that, our faculty are also very interested in this area, and we have many faculty members who do research on these uh, topics as well. So um, I'll stop there, happy uh, to discuss this further at any point, but I'd like to take this oppo opportunity to introduce Zia Khan. Dr. Khan oversees the Rockefeller Foundation's approach for achieving impact and realizing the organization's mission and goals. He is the Vice President for Initiatives and Strategy and a key supporter of this report. So Dr. Khan, let me turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Professor Jahar, and thanks to all of you for joining us today. And I think what will be a very interesting presentation, also panel discussion. I just wanted to uh, frame a few remarks as to why we at the Rockefeller Foundation find this work so compelling and so important to the work that we're trying to do. I will take it as a given that I don't need to explain that business can be helpful to society, uh, to this audience here, and that can, it can help us solve some of the big issues of poverty and address the issues that the vulnerable and disadvantaged face. And we know that something that all businesses require, including those focused on social outcomes, is capital. And it was the recognition of this need and building on what other people had been doing for many years that in 2007, the Rockefeller Foundation uh, decided to focus on this and have a big convening of lots of people, many of whom are here today, to think about this issue and really coined the term impact investing to give a name and a call to action to a new industry. And we supported this work under the leadership of uh, Anthony as the managing director of that work. We support an initiative for about seven years to accelerate the development of the impact investing industry, spending about $40 million helping conduct research and build some of the industry associations like the Global Impact Investing Network and Jin that Amit is here representing, and helping build the ecosystem so that people can think about impact investing as a more efficient way to move capital to achieve both financial and social gains. However, we know that's not enough. And we know that in order to address the big issues that we're facing, these enterprises really need to scale beyond what they were able to do just in terms of receiving capital uh, from financial investors. And this is something that we've been thinking a lot about at the foundation. And uh, the Monitor Deloitte team, who has put together this really excellent work, really put their finger on and studied in more detail, which was to understand not only are there difficulties to scale the organization like any business would face, but there's something about the ecosystem in which these organizations sit that we have to think about. And in their framework, those include things like what are the value chains in which these organizations sit, what are the policy enablers, and what are the regulations that we need to all think about. And this is something that at the Rockefeller Foundation we also think a lot about because one of our goals is with our very limited funding and with our very flexible funding, how can we catalyze the development of industries? And so we see ourselves as being and playing the role of an industry facilitator, which is one of the roles that this report calls out to. 
So I am very excited to introduce Harvey, who will give us a formal presentation of some of the findings in this report. And then we'll have a panel discussion where uh, a number of us will sit down and debate and pose lots of questions to each other and hopefully hear from you as well. Harvey. Thank you very much, Zia. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening. Um, I'm Harvey Ko. I'm from Monitoring Inclusive Markets. Um, we're a unit based in Mumbai. It's a bit uh, boomy. I'll step away. Um, unit based in Mumbai. We're a social action unit. We're not part of the commercial business of Deloitte, um, and we're there really to drive impact through market-based solutions. Uh, most of the work actually is running programs on the ground in India, trying to scale up solutions that we believe work, so housing, water, sanitation. Uh, and alongside that, we do a program of global research where we investigate issues that we think are important for the field globally and publish the work, as we have done in this report that we've, um, we've just put out. Let me find the clicker. So just to step back a bit and think about the problem that we're addressing before I jump into any of these things about solutions, right? So here are just some of the issues that I think face uh, the poor in developing countries when we think about using market-based solutions. It's not just that they don't have money, they also lack access to basic services, like uh, access to shelter, like access to good livelihoods. The thing that strikes you when you look at these stats is just the scale of these problems, right? The problems of global poverty are absolutely vast, and that's why we care about scale. So when we think about market-based solutions, they have to do three things. They have to have impact, obviously. They have to make money in some way, commercially viable, financially sustainable, and they have to attain scale. And you can have your own definition of what scale is, but we want it to have a meaningful level of scale against the level of problems uh, that we're addressing. The problem is that when you look at this field of market-based solutions, what we see is that there's a lot of small-scale innovation, right? There's lots of inspiring entrepreneurs, fantastic technologies. They're often working at a very small scale, and many of them struggle to get beyond the first hundred or first thousand customers or beyond the first few districts where they're operating. And so the question is, how do we take all this stuff that's working very well at the small scale and make it large scale? So it's serving millions or tens of millions of people and not hundreds or thousands. So we've seen this in our own work in India. Um, we've been running a housing program for the past eight years now, trying to get a private sector unsubsidized model for um, low-income housing up and running. Um, we have been really focused on getting these households who live in slums in a place like Mumbai into high quality houses like that, um, which are still connected to the city center through good transport and have good amenities around them, schools, hospitals, and so on. We've now worked, um, there are now a whole bunch of projects around the country, about 100,000 households have now been helped to move into these new developments. 100,000 households sounds like a pretty good number, until you realize that the total addressable market for this is 22 million households in India. So we've got a long way to go to get to our idea of scale for this solution. But the other thing that struck us as we went on this journey was um, it was a much longer and more complicated journey than we imagined. Right? When we started, uh, when Ashish really, my colleague here, started this work eight years ago, you know, we thought it was going to be a six-month project working with a few developers to put up the first few projects, and once those were sold, the whole market would take off. But it didn't happen, right? So we ended up getting sucked into um, mortgage finance because we realized that actually for poor customers trying to get these houses, if you're low income and you're in the informal sector, you don't have documents to prove your income, no bank's going to give you a mortgage. So we incubated a new housing finance company to serve those customers. Um, we then realized that these people were running into lots of regulatory hurdles because when you, know, you try to get a project through, it takes two years to get approvals. And that really you know, wrecks the economics of the project, makes it much less uh, attractive for people to move into it. So then we started working with the government at the central and state and local levels to try to streamline regulations uh, for the sector. We then thought, okay, well, that's now kind of humming along, but um, are we achieving the outcomes for these households that we intended? And so we started this project that the Rockefeller Foundation is also funding called the Unintended Consequences Project. You know, are we tracking these families, understanding what's happening to them as they buy these houses, take out these loans, move into these new areas, move into these new buildings? You know, is everything working out right? And as usual, there are always some things that don't work out. You know, we need to feed that learning back into the industry and help it course correct 
and get to a sustainable level of scale. So we fell into this thing um, that we now call industry facilitation by accident. We didn't set out to do it. We just set out to scale a model. And we thought it would be easier starting with a firm, um, but it became much more systemic in nature. And so when we started um, speaking to the Rockefeller Foundation and, and the GIN and a number of other partners 15 months ago, we were just surprised by the level of interest in this question. You know, how do we get market-based solutions to scale and how do we do it really well? Uh, so we've been on this learning journey with our partners and we're very thankful for them, uh, for their support, not just in terms of funding, but also their expertise and their data and insight. And so what have we found? Um, when we think about scaling barriers for market-based solutions, the obvious way to start is with the firm, right? So you've got not enough money. You know, uh, you've got a team that needs to be built up. You've got a business model that might need to be worked on or a strategy that, you know, might have some flaws, so you need to iron those out. So obviously you need to work on all those things, and that's the natural starting point for market-based solutions. But what we've realized and seen in all the cases that we've researched is that the barriers go far beyond the firm. Um, you've got barriers in the value chain, right? So who are the suppliers who are going to give you the critical inputs for what you're going to create? Uh, where are the distributors who are going to take your products to the customers that live maybe in remote rural areas or in informal settlements in the cities? If you're trying to sell them something that's durable, like a house or a cook stove or a solar home system, who's going to give them financing to buy that system? Um, they don't have a lot of cash lying around. So all these issues in the value chain really need to be sorted out. Beyond that, though, there's a bunch of barriers around public goods, right? Because these are things that affect the whole industry, um, but they're not really in the, in the incentive set of anyone to provide them. Um, so one of those is just basic industry know-how, right? Who's going to develop the business models, market information that allows these firms to actually operate and serve these customers or to serve these producers? Um, another one is customer awareness of new products, right? So one of the examples we look at in the report is clean cook stoves in India, which are a solution to indoor air pollution. The problem in India is that households don't really see indoor air pollution as a problem, right? And so you're trying to sell them a solution for a problem that they don't recognize. And so helping them understand that these are problems and that there are solutions to this actually is a public good that benefits all the firms uh, in the industry. And the problem is, it's not in the incentives, you know, this, the firms are not incentivized to solve these, right? So the first firm that goes out there to solve this problem will benefit everyone else, um, probably as much as they're benefiting themselves, maybe even more than they're benefiting themselves. Um, and then finally, you've got government, really, you know, government frameworks for regulation and policy, um, which are really kind of a special kind of public good, right? But they operate in a very specific way, and so we really want to call those out um, separately. So taxes, subsidies, uh, regulatory frameworks, um, even kind of you know, ad hoc official intervention at the local level. All those things you can see could get in the way of scaling your solution. Uh, and sometimes they get in the way because government's just not thinking about your innovative solution. They're thinking about mainstream business and create regulatory frameworks to regulate mainstream business, not your new model. So when you put all these things together, and we realize that when you look at market-based solutions that are really trying to provide better goods and services, better livelihoods for the poor, it's not unusual to see barriers at every level of this framework. And what was really troubling to us was that we weren't really having a conversation about how we were going to systematically tackle these barriers. And in fact, if you, if you listen to a lot of the discourse um, around impact investing and you know, supporting market-based solutions, it seems to be that we're expecting firms to sort this out themselves. Right? So there's a lot of talk about investing in companies, funding companies, capacity building companies, generally you know, maybe just one or two companies. And the expectation is that they will then do all of this. And in our experience, it's actually very, very difficult for them to do that. Um, it's a very tall order just to build your own company um, and sort out all the issues at the level of the firm, to expect the entrepreneur to then take on this vast array of challenges, including changing policy and building public goods out there, is actually a very, very tall order. And so um, we took this framework and said, let's figure out how this has been resolved um, in our collective experience. You know, where can we find cases in the past of people trying to build these industries? You know, what were the barriers? How were they resolved? who resolved them. 
Um, and we actually found over 150 cases around the world. Uh, we zeroed in on, on a small number, about 38, that we went um, in depth into. And then we selected an even smaller number, about six or seven, that we've now profiled in the report. And I would encourage you to, to read the report because it actually lays out some very detailed case studies of how um, industries that are scaling successfully now actually encountered very, very critical barriers early in their uh, development and then had um, support from facilitators to help overcome those working in and alongside um, the firms. And the, the common theme um, really, uh, well, let me just name some three of the case studies that I think are particularly interesting. So one of them is mobile money in Tanzania. A lot of you will know about mobile money in Kenya, and and Faricom. Um, in the next breath, people normally say, well, but that's so exceptional, right? Where do you find this kind of near monopoly um, such as Safaricom was in Kenya? Um, most markets are more competitive, more fragmented. It's kind of hard to do that. Uh, what's interesting in Tanzania is it started out very badly. It looked like a failure for the first two years because it bumped into all these barriers that um, were in the ecosystem. And then uh, a facilitator in the form of the Gates Foundation and FSTT came in to help remove those barriers. And now we have a, an industry that has very high levels of penetration, about the same level as in Kenya, and much more competitive. So there are four uh, providers here, not one. And the transaction costs for the customer are two-thirds cheaper in Tanzania than they are in Kenya. So an amazing success story, um, which didn't start out very well. Um, the other two, very quickly, MFI in India, people know about this. Um, what's interesting is people know about the origins of MFI and the MFI model, and people know about the later stage in terms of you know, the IPOs and the amazing amount of money people made through that, but not very much about how they got from one to the other, right? how they got from these kind of grassroots NGOs working in, in the uh, rural parts of India to becoming these huge companies. So obviously there was a fair bit of facilitation there. Uh, and then the third one I'll mention is smallholder tea in Kenya. So this is one of the most exceptional agribusiness uh, companies that we've seen serving smallholder farmers. And actually it's very little known outside of a small group um, of practitioners. And now they engage over half a million smallholders um, in, in Kenya. And the impacts are real, right? So this is what it means to be served by the Kenyan tea model. You know, farmers in Kenya earn three to five times what their counterparts in other countries do because of the success of this model. Multiply that by 560,000 smallholders, and that's starting to make a meaningful impact on the problems of poverty. The common theme across all the cases that we saw was that we not only saw these amazing companies, which obviously are held up to be um, very bold and very you know, strategic and have brilliant models and brilliant leadership, which obviously was true, but also these facilitators who are often working behind the scenes to remove these barriers and support the companies and build the ecosystems for them to scale. And I think if you look down, it's obviously there are some familiar names on the right-hand side, but you know, often the stars of the story we think about are the companies, right? And actually we don't think about the role played by facilitators, even though from our point of view, they're as critical to the success of models as the firms are and the investors are. So let me just leave you with five um, very high-level key lessons before we go into the panel discussion. Um, and these are, um, I think that the feedback is always, you know, th these are so high-level as to almost be maybe um, simplistic. But at the same time, when you think about whether they're being done, you know, we're not seeing them being done um, out in the field. Um, so the first one is, and this is a very old lesson, we've been talking about this for eight years, um, get the business model right for scale. It's not about a great, only about a great technology or a great entrepreneur, um, it's also about getting the business model right. And sometimes business models that work well at a small scale don't work well at a large scale. So you've got to refine the business model over time to get it to be scalable. And this is the consistent theme through all the successful case studies that we've seen. The second, and I've been talking about this already, is we really need to invest in industry facilitation. And that's about resolving barriers to scale that benefit all the firms in industry, not just one or two. Um, and what, the, what we hope is that actually you know, industry facilitation is seen to be part of the basic toolkit of working on market-based solutions. It's as basic as investing or funding in companies. The third is, you know, not everyone is going to be able to do everything that's required to remove these barriers. If you think about the range of barriers that come up against market-based solutions, 
it's highly unlikely that one player can actually remove all of them, even if they come in to facilitate. So the question is, how are we going to be able to work as part of teams, as part of networks, to be able to remove these barriers? And the case studies we've identified um, provide some pointers on how to do that. Um, fourth, we need to anticipate the risks that come with scale. So, so far I've been talking about getting to scale as though when you got to a level of scale, your work was done. Obviously, it's not. Um, and you only have to look at the MFI and, um, sector in India to see that actually scale itself brings new risks, brings new challenges, brings new problems. And so facilitators have to think about what those risks might be and try to mitigate them even as industries scale. And then finally, commit and adapt. Um, these, despite the simplicity of the diagram that I put up, um, these things are neither quick nor easy. Uh, some of the case studies in the report stretch out over five or six decades. Um, mobile money obviously was very quick, but Kenyan tea took four or five decades to play out. So we really need facilitation to be committed for the long haul, um, and it does take I mean, at least five to ten years in our experience for models to get to a significant level of scale. But at the same time, this is not something that you can decode up front before you jump into it, right? And so adaptation is key. You know, when you go into it, you will see, you know, you will have some analysis of the barriers and what you're going to do. But once you get into it, you know, things change and opportunities emerge and new barriers emerge that then need to be uh, addressed by facilitation. Um, obviously, the key is how do you do this, right? It's, 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 fast. it's great to say this is all that needs to be done. Uh, our experience on the ground in India with housing and water and sanitation um, has shown us that it's much more difficult than it seems as I'm putting five points up. So to discuss that, we're going to call on our esteemed panel. Uh, and I'll invite my colleague Ashish Karamchanan to moderate the session. Good evening, everyone. I'm Ashish Karamchandani of Monitor Inclusive Markets, and it's a real privilege to be here with all of you and with this panel. It's a unique panel. You know many of the people here, but let me just go over some of the key points of this panel. I'm going to start with Zia, who didn't mention that his earlier life, he was actually a strategy consultant helping firms grow. So he comes from the actual essence of the individual organization and helping it grow. And then you have him juxtaposed into Rockefeller, where everything is programmatic and you think at a much different and higher level. So welcome, Zia. It's great to have you here with both those hats on. I'm going to move on to Amit. And that is because he's the man who's been involved with impact investing from its origin. He was helping develop the strategy for the impact investing world when he was part of Monitor Institute and then became the first managing director and has been leading the global impact investing network since its start. Welcome, Amit. Thanks. And we're fortunate enough to have Anthony here, who's an alumni of Columbia. And the point I want to make about Anthony is that he's actually a practitioner. He started life and was initially, in his early days, forgive me a bit with McKinsey, but um, <laughs> with uh, TechnoServe, working on the ground in Africa. So he's seen it all the way from being on the ground to being part of Rockefeller, where he was the founding chairman. He led Rockefeller's work in impact investing and was the founding chairman of the Global Impact Investing Network. In fact, it's still the chair of the network, and now has a very different hat. He works with the Nonprofit Finance Fund, which is funding nonprofits in the US for their capital needs. And so he brings a developed sector perspective, developed country perspective into this discussion. And mm -hmm. lastly, but not the least, real privilege to have you here, Geeta. Uh, all of you know Geeta, so I don't need to introduce her. But she has the privilege of being an academic and actually observing the rest of us. <laughs> and saying all the smart things that need to be said. So welcome. <laughs> now you put me on the spot. <laughs> hey, that's where we want you. And uh, just about myself, as uh, Harvey mentioned, I am part of Monitor Inclusive Markets, and the role I'm going to take in this panel is actually twofold. One is helping me moderate the panel, but also as a practitioner, having worked in low-income housing for the last eight years, I'll try to bring a bit of that perspective also to the panel. So with that, what I'm going to ask each of the panelists to do is actually spend five minutes giving us a little bit of context behind their interest in this. First of all, where have they seen the need 
for going beyond the individual firm and looking at the ecosystem around them? And then have they done any of it themselves? And if so, how? So with that framing question, I'd like each of the panelists to spend three to five minutes on it. And then I'm going to open it up to questions to the audience, because that's where usually the most fun is. The only request I'm going to have for people in the audience is keep it to queries. We have a phenomenal panel. And I'd rather not have long statements about what people have done in life, but actually targeted questions at the panel. Zia, I'm going to ask you to start. Actually. Sure, OK, thank you. Um, so I'll, I'll tell maybe two stories of work that uh, we're doing at the foundation. And actually, maybe before I even start, I should talk a little bit about the strategy of the foundation and what we see our role. Um, so we're in our 101st year uh, this year. We celebrated our centennial last year. And it's amazing to have the luxury of this history behind us because we can look through our archives and records and understand what worked and what didn't work. And pretty much every time we do that, the story looks similar. It is that we had a really dedicated team enter a problem space, think about the system as a whole in terms of the role of communities, of government, of different actors, and how all of them need to weave together, and what was the unique and catalytic role of the foundation in providing the funding and also leveraging our brand and our relationships to make that happen and exit as well. And we're facing that even today. And we have better language for it today because we have social entrepreneurs and we have market-based solutions and we have impact investing. But that pattern remains the same. So the first story is around how do we address the problem of youth employment in Africa. Youth employment is a global phenomenon. Everyone is worrying about it. In Africa, it's particularly important given their youth bulge. And we looked at a lot of different areas. And one model that came that emerged that was quite intriguing to us was the notion of outsourcing digital work. So this is a situation where eBay may need to have some images tagged to confirm that people are taking pictures of the thing that they're selling. It's not the most complicated task, but it's one that you can send easily over the internet, which is growing in penetration to Africa, to a desktop in Africa where someone can confirm that, or someone can transcribe a voice transcription, et cetera. So it was a very interesting model. And there's lots of, um, I shouldn't say there's lots, but a couple of pioneering firms, Digital Data Divide, who's a partner of ours, and also Source as well, that have come up with very interesting models of how can they reach disadvantaged youth, provide them with the required training and equipment to look at this and, and uh, start a business around this. However, you realize there's lots of things missing with this business. One is the training infrastructure. This is something that lots of companies in the for-profit sector count on with universities, et cetera, providing that. But in this case, these enterprises have to provide the training. Another is a set of standards or quality control. So how do they reach out to clients, and how can they uh, provide service level agreements when there isn't an industry-wide set acceptance of what this is? The third is even just marketing this concept. There's no general awareness of what this is among potential buyers, et cetera. And then there's government policy. You know, government can play a big role in catalyzing this, but also you know, what can government do in terms of providing some regulations um, and an enabling environment in different countries for what needs to happen. So these are all the kinds of things that we're wrestling with right now. And our hope is that if we can harness the energy of entrepreneurs and the, their ingenuity, what can we do to provide a helping hand in this ecosystem so that we can catalyze this market-based solution and address some of the barriers that um, Harvey was pointing to in terms of the value chain, uh, both the buyers and the supply of where the work is coming from, the public goods, the training institutions, and then also the role of government. So that's kind of one story. And just more briefly, I'll talk about another story that we're facing right now, which is around rural electrification in India. And this is a particularly interesting situation where the grid is not extending into rural areas and won't do so for another 50 years at least. But there are interesting distributed renewable energy solutions where you can create miniature power plants to provide power to villages. Now, these power plants, unfortunately, have not proven to be profitable on their own. But simultaneously in India, there's a massive expansion of cell phone towers into rural areas. And so there is a model where you can create a renewable energy power plant that has a cell phone tower as an anchor client and then provides electricity to the village. 
The question is how do you get this set up simultaneously? Because the telephone towers wants to make sure that there's going to be load coming from the community, and the community needs to know that the cell phone tower will start it up. Well, there are ways to provide subsidies. There are ways to tap into government programs. And there are ways to create value chains to help catalyze this. The economic value is there. It's just getting it started. So this is another situation that we're faced. So for us, this work is really compelling and really important because it helps guide us in what unique role we can play, given that we're a different kind of actor, that we don't actually participate in market-based solutions, but we aim to help catalyze them and get them going. Thanks, Yad. It's great to get these real examples from you. I'm going to move to Amit to ask him to give us his perspective, having been at the start and leading Global Impact Investing Network. Sure. Uh, thanks, Ashish. And thank you all for joining us. And congratulations on this report. I think it's a really important contribution to our space. Um, so uh, the, the GIN is a, a nonprofit organization um, that in itself acts as an industry facilitator. Uh, so we're focused on increasing the scale and effectiveness of impact investing globally. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with it, impact investing is an approach to investing that attempts to both make a financial return while also generating a social or environmental impact. And so this is something that um, uh, is, is quite critical to us because when we think about um, the work in this report, many of our members, and we have 190 members around the world uh, in about 30 countries, um, who are all different types of impact investors, ranging from major foundations like the Rockefeller Foundation, uh, intermediaries like the Nonprofit Finance Fund, and, um, and other um, industry actors uh, like Deloitte. Um, but they are all trying to figure out how they can make investments that address issues like sustainable agriculture, access to rural energy, um, and, and a number of other areas. Um, but they also, so they both invest in firms, but they want to see these solutions scale. Uh, so we supported this project because we think it's of critical importance to the way that investors are thinking about their own activities. Um, but what I'm going to speak about is actually the role that the GIN plays as an industry facilitator for the impact investment market. Um, now, it's not a perfect analog to the analysis in the report because impact investing isn't one specific type of business model uh, like microcredit or some of the other examples used. Um, but it is a new approach that when the GIN was launched five years ago, um, was very exciting, um, had been pioneered by a number of organizations around the world, um, but was largely subscale as an activity and very inefficient. So it's very difficult to be an impact investor. Um, but we came into this, and all of our supporters, like the Rockefeller Foundation and others, believed that impact investing was a critical way of increasing the scale of so many other types of, um, of entrepreneurs around the world who are addressing the world's most critical problems. Uh, so the challenge for us was try to, trying to think about how do we take this very diverse community of investors and support them to scale their activities. And so the GIN in itself is acting as an industry facilitator, and we work with a number of other uh, funders and organizations who are trying to support this work. But what we've had to think through is that, that fine balance between um, the competitiveness of firms, uh, and investors, of course, compete with one another um, for deals and, and, um, and also transact with one another. Um, but they all need this to be an effective market so they can thrive. And so we focus on developing a lot of the public goods at a global level that will support them. Uh, so we work with uh, on projects like IRIS, which is a catalog of uh, social, environmental, and financial performance indicators. Uh, we do research and partner with firms like uh, Monitor Deloitte to support their research that we think will help investors become more effective at achieving impact. Um, and we also provide a number of other resources and fora for investors to talk and share practices. Um, but it is, it's a, it's been a fascinating experience for us to figure out how do we scale this activity um, while recognizing the fact that many of our members compete with one another. Um, but I think there's a shared recognition amongst our membership that they all need to have a broader industry. Um, all those things that Harvey was speaking about in his presentation whether it's a, an effective value chain, uh, public goods, and also supportive government policy, uh, for them to be able to deploy capital efficiently, and of course, to achieve the impact that they all hope to have. Thanks, Amit. I'm going to ask Anthony to speak more about sort of his perspective now from the developed world on the need for facilitation. Yeah. Is uh, there a need for facilitation? No, absolutely, and thanks so much. It's great to be here. I will always come and uh, speak at re things linked to what the team in Monitor Inclusive Markets has done. Um, for years, you guys have been doing those, the smartest fact-based research um, that takes an enthusiasm for what we're all trying to do, but a very 
um, measured and youthful skepticism by, about the hype that's out there. And since the first report, emerging markets, emerging models, still the best thing written about market-based solutions to poverty. If anyone else has something better, I'd love to know about it. Um, but it's something you guys have made immense contributions on the, on the analytical front. And I think this report continues that trend. Um, I also just wanted to say um, thank you to Sandra Navali, who um, those of you who are at Columbia, I don't know if you guys know Sandra, but you're incredibly blessed to have her and the spirit and energy she brings to this work. Uh, it is remarkable that on a beautiful Monday night, there's like 200 people here in a windowless room. Um, and I think it's in no small part to the work that Sandra and others around here have been doing for years to create a real center of energy around this work here. Um, so I just wanted to say personally, I do, I'm not an alum. I, uh, I do carry the title adjunct, although I'm, Sandra keeps trying to get me back in the classroom and I haven't been here for too long. Um, but did want to just um, you know say thank you to Sandra for everything she's done in terms of leadership of this work. Um, and again, I, I feel like a bit of a, uh, uh, well, why not? <laughs> um, I feel like a bit of an imposter. I think as you've heard, I did spend a few years at the Rockefeller Foundation leading the work on impact investing. And prior to that, I ran a organization that I would now, now I now know what we did in Kenya. We were industry facilitators. Um, I ran a nonprofit there called TechnoServe. Is anyone here familiar with TechnoServe? Anyone here worked with TechnoServe? Oh, no one. Okay. Oh, someone in the back. Um, but what TechnoServe did and has been doing since 1968, it's a grant-funded nonprofit that uses grant money to nowadays work with businesses and farmers in rural areas to help them um, like the Kenyan Tea Development Authority, find more lucrative ways to participate in modern value chains. And um, you know, it's interesting. We were a funny, or you know, we, it was hard to explain what we did because we took grant money on one hand, but then we turned around and helped businesses grow. Um, but now I realize this is very much what we were doing, and we were doing it for a set of companies who didn't have around them the normal infrastructure that a profit-seeking business seeking only to make money does in the first world, which in which the role of facilitator is often played by other people in the industry, trade associations, and the investors into those businesses. And our clients didn't have that. Um, but specifically, and I've been asked just quickly to talk about how this plays out in a, in a developed world context, there's a lot that we are learning and have learned about how this plays out outside of the developed world that is very relevant to where we are. We still live in the West in a societies that are by no means what they should be when it comes to the social issues we care about, whether it's access to basic services, minimum level of justice or opportunity, uh, a lot, there's a lot still be, to be done. And my organization, the Nonprofit Finance Fund, has been taking a market-based approach uh, to our, making a small contribution here in the U.S. And just quickly want to talk about the role um, we started. Uh, we began in 1980. Um, I often say, you know, those of you who remember that in the late 1970s, the oil price spiked. Um, I don't pretend to be so old that I actually remember that, um, but it makes for a good opening. So in the late 1970s, the oil price spiked, and a lot of homeless shelters and big Social service agencies here in New York City were being bankrupted by their heating oil bills. Um, and in 1980, the prevailing sense was that if you ran a nonprofit in New York City and you were being bankrupted by your heating oil bills, then the appropriate thing to do was to go to your foundation supporters and ask them for more money because your costs had gone up. And we were born, the Nonprofit Finance Fund, out of a very simple realization that those organizations, in fact, didn't need more grant money. Uh, what they needed was a loan. And with those loans, they could put in new boilers and windows massively improve their energy efficiency, massively reduce their heating oil needs, and therefore provide the same social services at the same level of expense that they had before the oil price spiked. And so what we began life as was effectively a market-based solution, which was the idea that a loan could be a viable way to help a nonprofit manage its ability to serve. Um, and we were a market-based solution that was in deep need of scaling. Because at the time, there were very few organizations around the country in which nonprofits and finance had been able to get together uh, and make the connections that worked. And over the last 34 years, we have been one of the organizations that has really helped build an industry around various aspects of this work. And I think what's very important about this new research is the focus on what goes on around the entrepreneur and the organization as opposed to just looking at the organization. So we have certainly, we have grown, as have our peers, um, around the community development finance in industry, which in the U.S. now has about $30 billion, and there are about 900 of us who have that formal designation with the Treasury. Um, what I love when I talk to people who work in India is, you know, when you said 10 million people is a nice start. Um, and, it, you know, I think 30 billion and 900 organizations and me reaching a few million is great. In India, that would be called a pilot. Um, but, you know, we certainly have gotten to a scale, and, and there's no doubt in looking at this research that it has not been because savvy individual entrepreneurs were so good at what they did that they did it alone. It has been because of a set of changes that happened in each of the dimensions that the report covers around especially policy that induced the large banks to participate in the industry, 
which then gave an incentive for them to actually develop the intermediaries. Uh, happy to get into the details of that later, but it's certainly true that at the Nonprofit Finance Fund and with our peers, we have benefited from being part of a much bigger story than ourselves. The other half of our life, and I'll, I'll end with this, at the Nonprofit Finance Fund is linked to work we do where we actually work with nonprofits themselves to help them become more sustainable and to manage their finances more effectively. Um, and in that work, what we've really seen is how hard it is for individuals who run organizations to step up from the day-to-day -day work of simply trying to survive to participate in all of this industry building activity. And I think this is, again, a very salient part of this report that might have been originated looking at cook stove entrepreneurs in Ghana or people selling microcredit in India, but it is just as relevant for the clients that we work with. Um, and two quick examples, we did some work uh, the last few years in Hawaii, which has, sounds glamorous, it's actually one of the poorest states in America, uh, has a lot of communities who are quite isolated geographically from essential services and has by far the oldest population in America, not just of older people, but of what's called elder older people, people older than 85 years old. They are the front end of a wave that will hit the mainland, but right now they are facing a situation in which the services available for poor, mostly native Hawaiians, has completely unable to keep up with the pace of the increase in demand for services. And so it's a natural case where we need scaled solutions and we need the organization serving those, that community, to transform what they do. Our clients who run those agencies are struggling so hard on a day-to-day -day basis to survive that it is impossible for them to muster an industry-wide solution to create the kind of change that has to happen at the policy level, at the public goods level, um, and more generally around the enabling environment. And so we are, not, in that case, we do play the role of facilitator because we are able to raise grant funding and go in and talk to these organizations. And there's something on an emotional level quite empowering about being told it's not you. Your failure to scale or your failure to keep up with demand is not because you are bad at doing what you do, which in a mission-oriented organization is devastating emotionally. And to locate what is taking people, actually you are in a system that makes it much harder for you to do what you do. And I think it's especially important because the prevailing mentality out there is if only you ran yourself like a good business. Uh, well, the truth is good businesses, the ones that don't go bankrupt, which happens a lot, um, but even the ones that do succeed are doing it in a much easier environment. So I think there's an important part of this work that says, on an emotional level to entrepreneurs, um, your inability to meet your own goals, your social impact goals, is because you are being punished by a system that's not functional, and we cannot expect you as individuals to take that on hold yourself because it's hard enough just to, to keep the lights on. I think we see that often with our clients. Thanks, Anthony. That's extremely helpful. Um, before actually turning it over to Geeta, I'm going to give a little bit of experience that we've had as a facilitator to give some context behind us as a practitioner. So as Harvey said, we started life actually by saying that we'll try to go out and do something ourselves, not just write reports. And the whole idea there was one of the areas we chose was low-income housing. And it seemed to be an interesting area because there, was a, there are a lot of low-income households in India that are renting housing, which means they're actually paying money month after month. So if we could convert that monthly payment into a mortgage payment, we could actually enable them to buy housing. And we did the classic research and we came up with some very innovative models. I won't go into the details and we thought, wow, that's going to be great. Went and talked to a bunch of developers because returns were quite nice. But the developers weren't interested. They were serving the higher end of the market and making even more money. And just the idea of going down and speaking to small customers, not very appealing to them. So we actually had to first of all do public awareness about what this actual opportunity was. Over a two-year period of raising awareness, we spoke to over 600 developers. And what we realized very quickly as we were speaking to them is they didn't just want an idea. They wanted support. So it's very nice to say build small houses because the model really here was small houses a little bit far away from the city but connected by public transport and have schools for their kids to go to. Every lower middle income household in India wants to send their kids to an English medium school. So the model hinged around localities that had schools, had the infrastructure, but were connected by transport and building small houses. So they said, that's all fine, but how do I make a small house? What, how, what are the designs? So we hired an architect to come up with designs. Then a friendly developer made a mock apartment, which is great because people could see it. But then the next thing was, how do I actually get this kind of land that works? So we had algorithms for land selection. That wasn't enough. How do I finance these customers? So we got a bunch of b banks to agree to do pilots. That still wasn't enough. <laughs> One developer said, okay, I'm interested, but how do I find these customers? So here's monitoring inclusive markets, hiring a salesperson. 
to actually go into factories where we had connections and sort of sign over your head saying, want a house come meet us, signing up customers. 200 customers, 450 houses, a waiting list of 9,000. That got Taral Bakeri very happy and his neighbor across the road also. But that just got things started in Ahmedabad. Luckily for us, Jerry Rao, who is an entrepreneur, well known for sort of having started India's eighth largest software company, got interested, which is great, because the newspaper started writing it up. So we were able to get some awareness going. But that's still not the end of the story. That's housing. What about financing for these houses? Nobody wants to give an informal sector customer who has no documentation a loan. A bank will do a pilot, but can they do 100,000 loans? And actually, as Harvey said, 22 million. So we actually had to start housing finance companies. I won't go into all the details. The 10 of them today, $200 million in loans. The first one, MHFC, recently declared its fifth year results, zero defaults. Is that the end of the story? Not yet. The problem is policy. So in Bangalore, if you want to build a house, for every house you have to have a parking lot. <laughs> 150 square foot parking lot. What's the size of your house? 300 square feet. For 300 square feet of house, you need 150 square feet of land <laughs> with an FSI of two. So I've got to get double the land because the law requirements requires me to. And at best, I have a cycle. I might actually get a motorcycle one of these days. A car, a bit tough. So we're now working on policy. Again, there you work with the central government to lay out guidelines, and then with state governments to actually change policy. And the reason I'm just saying this is, we didn't start out wanting to do all this. We started out wanting to provide housing, and that was it. And as we got into it, I think it comes back to the common theme here. If you're committed to a goal, you'll do anything to get there. And that's what got us accidentally into the world facilitator. We didn't know it also when we started. So I'm just giving you a little bit of context so you understand where we are coming from. And if there are questions around facilitation, happy to answer them. But now I want to turn it over to Geeta, because as she said she's going to have the last word. I'm going to give it to her. <laughs> so this is uh, fascinating. And uh, I think what we just heard from Ashish is a very personal investment for him, where he took on this role of doing housing and you know, at various stages along the way found obstacles. Because I think initially it sounds like, wow, it's a great idea. Developers should be grabbing this on, and it's going to really just take off. But I think over eight years, uh, what he's found and documented is all these barriers. And I think that must have been the impetus for this report as well. Um, so it's really a fascinating story. What Ashish just described now is a pool product you heard about the demand for that uh, housing units. It started really, uh, you know, huge waiting lists and so on. It's something everyone wanted. But a lot of what's documented in this report is about push products. And the way the report describes this is push products are those that you think are good for people, but people don't necessarily think so. So it could be clean drinking water, for example, or it could be uh, clean uh, cook stoves all of which we know to be good for you. It's like your vegetables, they're good for you, but you don't really want them, right? So the question is, as a marketing professor, to me always fascinating, how do you get people to adopt products that you know are good for them, but they don't necessarily think are good for them? Talking about that first uh, report that came out of Monitor Inclusive Markets, Emerging Markets, Emerging Models, they talked about the fact that in India, everyone wanted to buy gold coins. And why? They, I mean, they wanted to keep gold coins over clean drinking water. They valued gold coins more. So here, there, these are kind of anomalies that one can't really explain, but it's really fascinating and interesting to know about to then create interventions that can help uh, get to the social outcome that you want. So let me talk a little bit about clean drinking water. A few years ago, I created a course called um, social and marketing for, uh, for social enterprise. So it was a, a consulting course. We went with MBA students to India, and three cases came out of it. One of these was on uh, getting uh, villages in southern India to start buying clean drinking water from community uh, water treatment plants. So um, I grew up in India, but in urban India. So to me as well, traveling with MBA students, traipsing along in Andhra Pradesh, you know, in these little auto rickshaws and trains, it was quite alien to me as well as to the students. But we did a lot of research trying to find out why is it that people aren't drinking, you know, buying this clean drinking water. The uh, benefits are obvious, right? You know, health. We, we should be able to tell people this is good for you. What we found is people weren't really that keen on it. 
what they told us is, well, I'm used to going to the village well or the government tap, and that's where I've always got my water, and there's really no reason for me to buy this clean drinking water that you're touting to me, and I have to pay for it, and the well and the government water is free. What we also found is by Raju Foundation, who we were working with at that time on this consulting project, was one water treatment plant. At the same time, in the same village, there were other foundations and others setting up their own clean water treatment plants. So here's something where we should be trying to facilitate and get everyone to adopt this product, but instead we started seeing some kind of encroachment, competition mentality taking over. And then the question is, each one saying that if I get people to adopt clean drinking water, you know, that's going to increase everyone's uh, um, profits, so to speak. And so, you know, what I'm going to do is come up with my own sneaky ways to do it, but not necessarily go about the job of creating awareness of this public good. So I think we heard that from Harvey up front. So this was a real challenge. Who's going to do it? And so the question comes back to this facilitation. Who could be the industry key players and facilitators to do this? And um, the question we found was not just about uptake, because when something is new and novel, you will get awareness, you will get people trying it out, but it's really about consistent use. Because people would buy clean drinking water during the monsoons because they saw the value of it, the well water was dirty. So this speaks to another technique of visualization that I won't get into, but people would buy it in the monsoons, but not throughout the year. So again, it points to the need for somebody outside these individual firms to really get people to consistently increase their usage and adopt for their entire families uh, clean drinking water. So I found this aspect of this report really interesting and something that I think um, a lot of attention hasn't really uh, been paid to, and I think it's really an important barrier to adoption. Thank you, Geeta. I think the whole issue of public awareness is a key thing, and at the end of the day, the individual firms can't be held responsible for doing it because it is competitive. They all want to just get their own agenda out there. So having third-party facilitators actually facilitate that in some sense is fun that is critical. Can I, can I push on you on that just so we can have some fun? Because um, this is one thing that I, it's, it's in mainstream competitive businesses. I mean, David Del Sur, some of you probably know, is a hopefully soon famous, should be famous, uh, graduate of Columbia Business School who started a company called Fraud Tech. And he said recently, one of his investors said to him, and he's doing mission-based organization, trying to improve the livelihoods of um, small business owners in Latin America retail. I mean, it's a whole kind of impact-oriented organization. But he said, one of his investors just said to him, you know, Davi, there's never been a great business that didn't have fantastic competitors. Because to this point, he's been saying, well, it's really hard for me because I'm out there alone. But if my, if my idea is proven to be effective, then all these other people are going to crowd in and take our business. And I think what's missing in the analysis that says the individual enterprise cannot be held responsible at all for the public goods piece is a sense that that is what great organizations do. They create markets that not only they can thrive in, but that they have a first mover advantage in so that, yes, they will induce competitors, but the whole will be big enough to share. And so... That is certainly how it works in mainstream businesses. Now, is there a thesis you guys have that because the margins are inherently thin in this kind of business, therefore it's not as sustainable, against which I would just argue that there's, if we're talking about impact-oriented entrepreneurs, you know, I did say at the beginning that what they don't have is time because they're struggling to, and that's really true with our clients, but impact-oriented entrepreneurs are solving for a different question than how do I maximize my market share to make my most profit in the short term? Um, and I would argue that if, if there's something you could do that would be great for your mission, which is there's a lot more clean water, water available in these villages, and you refuse to do it because you are worried about losing your share, then as a mission-oriented organization, you need a new strategy. Because for a mission-oriented organization, I would argue that strategy is to identify those set of actions that are both great for impact and your mission and great for the business model. And if there are actions you can take that are good for one of those things than the other, then you need a new strategy. That's a great point. Thanks for challenging <laughs> the assumption. Um, I think the thin profit margins is a large piece of it because what we found is this organization was willing to do it at launch but just couldn't sustain the level of marketing effort that's needed to keep a campaign going over time. And so you found like initial uh, usage peak and initial adoption peak, but just the consistency died down. And I think you need something like a public awareness campaign to really get at this consistent usage over time just for lack of marketing dollars to spend on that. Do you have any thoughts on that? 
Well, I, I have a thought on the competition notion, which is a really interesting problem. Um, competition usually exists and uh, works best when there is a market. When there is not a market, almost any action by any player is can be distorting in some way. So I'll give an example. I was telling the story earlier about this youth employment effort that we have. And there's, there's social entrepreneurs who are doing a great job of creating the brand and sharing the stories of what they can do. Eventually, for that market to take off, we need the large business process outsourcers to take on this as a service line and effectively take and put these social entrepreneurs out of business. That is just the way things are going to evolve. So if you're a social entrepreneur, you have to scratch your head when you're working with us because that is sort of the market we're trying to catalyze. We're trying to get to a new equilibrium point where they will be fundamentally disadvantaged once there's more uh, scope and scale have their advantages. So I think social entrepreneurs are put in a tough spot when it comes to growing the market. Because I think I hear you on the strategy challenges of how they need to do the right thing, but sometimes the right thing is going out of business, and I think that's just a hard place for anyone to be. And I think it's easier for nonprofits. But if that social entrepreneur also has for-profit investors, as David Del Sur does in his business, Frog Tech, then it's not just the entrepreneur's choice. Um, because, and, I, and I think a lot of, a lot of these market-based solutions are, are solutions of the second best. It's, it's incredibly important to get a clean water plant into that village. Ultimately, there needs to be piped water from the government because that's even cheaper. Um, and so I think we see a lot of times where social entrepreneurs, whether they're nonprofits or not, but certainly the ones that take for-profit investors, who are then proposing solutions that even when they scale are not going to be as good as the ultimate steady state, which is going to be a government-delivered service. Um, this issue, I don't think we have a sector have confronted it yet. And I don't know if in your experience the impact investors you talk to are doing that because they are investing in a lot of these solutions. And we hear about cook stoves or um, solar lighting. I mean, solar lighting is known as the kerosene killer. Um, kerosene is a terribly dangerous, awful way to get lighting. It's also the way a lot of people rely on so there's a bunch of these solar light companies, some of which have impact investors, some of whom are members of the GIN, who are now growing their business models in order to get rid of the kerosene and come up with a much safer options, which is solar. Well, that's the kerosene killer. Ultimately, on-grid electrification or mini-grid electrification is going to be the solar light killer um, because that's an even better thing for someone, a poor family, to have. And so I do worry that we as a sector are not talking enough about this whole question of are we, this is really a means to an end, but once investors come in, then the end it's serving is not just impact. I'm going to let Amit have a word if he wants to on this and then open it up to the audience. Sure. Um, well, I think uh, what, and there's a lot of issues that have brought up, and what I'll touch upon is actually the you know, kind of the role and approach that an investor might have for this. Because I think when we think about um, the impact investment community, there are a couple of um, segments that you can think about, when, particularly when it comes to this approach of industry facilitation. I think there are many investors who, um, you could call them transactors or portfolio builders. Right? They're not necessarily focused on a specific issue, but are trying to build a portfolio that um, can, is more oriented towards having an impact um, rather than being agnostic about the impact that it's having on the world. And so they may pick uh, companies and, and funds in different types of industries in different regions of the world. Um, the, the type of impact, in, and I think, that, sorry, the question for them is how do they better engage with industry facilitators? Um, because they are looking at investing in businesses that are ultimately going to run up against some of these constraints, whether it be regulation or lack of a value chain uh, through which they can actually scale their work. We also have a set of uh, impact investors who you could think of almost as um, kind of problem solvers or solution driven, where they're kind of, and many foundations fit into this category as well as a number of individuals, where their entry into impact investing is really focused on a particular issue. It could be around sustainable fisheries or access to um, affordable private school education in India. And for them, it's a different um, model because they're trying to think about both how they invest in individual firms but how they build an ecosystem that will scale these solutions. And I think for that latter category, this, um, they both have a capacity to play a much greater facilitation role because they can orchestrate the work of others. But I think this question about how they balance this um, role between competition and cooperation becomes very complicated uh, because I think at, at its, its essence they, they do want firms to perform well and they of course want to get paid back um, but ultimately they're, they're striving for a higher goal and so I think it's been interesting to see a number of our investors uh, one of them is an investor that um, has invested in a company uh, in, um, in East Africa uh, that's focused on creating access to solar lighting for homes 
um, and amongst populations that live live off the grid. So very much speaking towards um, one of the um, issues that Anthony raised. Now what they've done is they also invest in a company that provides the solar lighting. So they invest in a company that's one of the largest customers for the solar lighting company, and they also invest in the largest supplier. Um, and so there's a you know the the business models for both in many ways are dependent upon the negotiation between them. Um, now they've that's an interesting conflict of interest that they have to manage. Right, because they both they want both businesses to scale and to be successful, um, and we asked one of their board members about how, about how they they do this, and they've they found I mean an interesting way to kind of navigate that. But I think ultimately what those companies realize is that their success is interdependent. Now it doesn't mean that they aren't both highly sensitive to those price negotiations, but both of them rely on one another to scale their activities. One's an important distribution channel for the product, and the other is a, a critical supplier for their entire business model. And so I think as we, one of the important contributions of this work is to, um, to, to, to stoke this dialogue about how do we become more sophisticated and not look just at the firm as a unit of analysis, but really looking at an entire problem and what are the ways that different types of interventions, whether it's impact investment, whether it's government engagement, or whether it's grant capital need to come together, um, which is very complicated and, and I think provokes a lot of these um, you know, interesting and difficult uh, questions. But ultimately, to get the solutions that we want, we're going to have to figure out a way to, to work that out. Thanks, Amit. These are complex questions. I'm going to open it up to the audience for questions. I know there is a question from here, or was at least. Uh, no, I just. Sorry, can you say who you are yeah, and if you have an affiliation I'm a outside of So I, I, I think that how that maturity and the exit piece gets played out, you know, how long is the term that you know the market's going to be competitive, which is real. And I would argue it has to do with who you start with in the management team. I'm making this case right now. The start in the management team and the alignment of certain players, but because you nonprofit industry work, commercial investment industry is all about get started, grovel on the ground for a while. Then we'll help you. Um, because you haven't paid your dues enough to be more in my view. It's a very bizarre concept. You sort of get what you pay for, you know, in this assumption of do we want a maturing business or do we want to watch folks struggle with a good idea and you know, they leave, they give up, they can't go without it. So I would argue that you know, business given what happened here, it's very important to maintain the team. But I also think I should ask, when you ask a question, your name, and if I you can say a specific person you want to answer from the panel, let us uh, know. I, I think it's a very real issue, but I think it's industry dependent. So uh, the maturing piece is for competitive market. It's hard because you could spend, you know, how do you get around that? You're going to lose your investment. Um, so yeah, for the majorities, if that's the case. So I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to understand the question. Okay. So. so You know, um, that's an unanswerable question, I think, uh, in terms of how long is the maturity, because one thing that I think is unique in the social sector compared to the private sector is just the nature of the complexity of the problems. I mean, strategy is something different. And strategy is more of a process in terms of uncovering the problem, uncovering the status quo as you grow. Who are the invested interests? So, you know, Anthony, you were talking about the kerosene market. You know, we've recognized there's this whole group of people uh, in India referred to as the diesel mafia, who will tolerate a demonstration here or there, but as soon as something starts to scale up, the, the resistance comes into play. The pol politicians come into play in different ways. So I can't quite answer a question around some steady state life cycle because it's the process of discovering the barriers has to be embedded in the strategy. The one comment I will make, though, um, is that the notion of social entrepreneurs is really based on a paradigm of someone who has found an innovative solution to create a good and then tries to figure out how to scale that up. And they're very attached to the process by which they're doing that. 
there aren't that many people running around saying, I want to grow an organization that will help a billion people, and I think I can do it through addressing energy, but it might be health, and I'm competing with those, and I'm going to start with this scalable idea. You see that in the private sector. There's lots of people running around with that scale in mind. That is something that I think we need to encourage more of, which I think gets it to one of the barriers you pointed out in your report of starting with scale in mind. That would be a different way to get to maturity than the sort of grow organic Other questions? Yeah. If you can just get the mic here. Uh, Ricky Suri from uh, Jamshedpur, India, involved with the two nonprofits. One is called Udyan Shalini Fellowship Program that empowers young women, and another called Kalaman that does rural development. So I'd just like to ask you a fundamental question and stand this whole seminar on its head. Why is it necessary to scale? I think you're barking up the wrong tree. I think, why is it necessary to be efficient? I think that's a terrible idea. Uh, I, I think, in fact, because I've actually lent three lakhs, which is about $5,000 of my own money, to about 12 to 15 rural women. And the way this was lent through was through this one local NGO. Uh, and there were loans ranging from 25 to 50,000 rupees. And, uh, there was a 10% interest, and one year later, I've gotten all my money back, and I've, gone, gone, I've, I've done it again. So, so the point is, well, you don't need to scale that particular organization. You need a million people like me lending three lakhs at a time. Why aren't you going it after that way? And as a matter of fact, the, the key link to making that loan, since we're talking about microfinance, is that one woman, 23 years old, Rashmi Murmu, who's a tribal, who speaks Santali, and can go deal with the people who borrowed the money you know, for like poultry farming, and be able to give them not just the money, but also tell them that, hey, don't spend the entire 50,000 buying chicks. Buy 25,000 chicks, keep 15 for feed, 5,000 for medicine, and 5,000 for... So she's got to dispense advice, and that is the critical point at which you need to kind of really expand. But, you know, the idea of, like, you know, what... I, I think what uh, Vikram Akula did with SKS was just, you know, ended up in total disaster because it's going to come collide with political realities at some point. So why scale? I mean, I think it's a horrible idea. And <laughs> yeah, um, completely agree that the point is not to scale the enterprise, but it is an absolute moral imperative to scale the solution. So if your question is why scale the enterprise, then I'm with you. And there's, But these industries have got to be scaled if you buy the premise that there's a set of essential goods and essential capabilities and opportunities that too many people in this world do not have access to that we could potentially help provide through these kinds of solutions. I think this question of why scale the enterprises is, is a really important one. And it goes back to Amit's point. One of the reasons why there's an emphasis on scaling the enterprise, because that's the unit by which the investor gets to re returns financially. Um, certainly from the perspective of a foundation that is focused on the social side, um, I suspect, I mean, Zia can very speak for himself, but certainly when I worked in a foundation, the focus was, is the is the product or the service available at scale? Um, and we were quite agnostic as to whether an individual organization got to the scale. So I uncompromisingly assert that we have to scale hundreds and thousands of times more than we have these solutions, but certainly agree with you that it is from a systems level, not the organization that needs to, to scale. But again, when you're talking about who you're bringing in to resource the system, often the unit of analysis that is salient to them, especially the private investor, is going to be the organization, and that investor will be paid back when the organization itself scales, unless, as in Ahmed's case, they're making a multiple plays along. And I think we also shouldn't be naive that for a lot of foundations, while theoretically the provision of the service to more people is an end in and of itself, when the foundation management team goes to their board and their board says, what have you done with our money, it is certainly helpful to say it is the specific organization we gave a grant to that is reaching more people. Um, which a lot of foundation asset owners, whether they're living donors or not, do have a moral right to ask about. Yeah, I, I think it's it's an important question, but I think I, I'd actually, um, if I may, just characterize it slightly differently, which is what is the right path to scale, um, and what's the right model for doing so? Because I think even in your example, um, you're talking about the you know the experience you've had as a lender. 
um, and how you think that's a model. But you also talked about how we need a million of you, right? And so that's another type of scaling, but it's through a model that you think is is, is more effective. And I, and I think the, the question for, for all of us is, you know, what is the most effective model that serves the needs of the clients or the beneficiaries, but also, you know, can address the, all the statistics that Harvey presented? And you know, we have astounding numbers of people who are facing poverty you know, here and abroad. And, and I think there's, the people who are seeking sale are coming from a good place. Um, but the question is, what are the right kind of safeguards that need to be in place to make sure that you know, it's not compromising the fundamental values of the whole uh, kind of the enterprise itself? Um, got a bunch of questions there. Anybody got a mic? Yeah. Guy in the back. Thank you. Hi, my name is Josh. Uh, I work with the Greater New York Hospital Association. Um, and I think my question is for Amit, uh, but anybody can feel free to swing at it. Um, how likely do you see the, the scalable business models to incorporate uh, social, environment, social and environmental measures, such as those that are defined in the IRIS um, initiatives, to determine the financial returns are for investors? How much did he pay you for that question? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so just to make sure I had it uh, cor correctly, so what, what portion of those um, are producing financial returns for investors? Right. Like yeah. What portion or how likely do you see that trend kind of continuing into the seriously uh, undertaking? Yeah. Yeah, so I think, and I'll, I'll give it a shot and make sure, I'm, I'm not sure I caught all the nuance in your question, but I think what we've found is that there's a great number of uh, enterprises now who are um, using IRIS. Um, they vary in how they use it. Um, and, and IRIS uh, yeah, is a, it's a catalog of social, financial, and environmental performance metrics. So this is a, a component of public good that um, the GIN has helped steward uh, in the market. So essentially the, the, the problem it's trying to solve is that we had a market full of investors and enterprises we're all trying to solve a number of problems, but we're defining the dynamics and the characteristics of those problems differently. So everything from you know, creating a job, people would define a job differently, and, or serving a client through a microfinance um, product. And the reason why that, the, the um, fragmented definitions is such a challenge and why this is such an important public good is because ultimately you can't understand if you're doing a good job if every business you invest in defines this, these things differently. Uh, whether it's something fundamental like access to clean water, renewable energy, something else. And so we have these in the financial sector. Uh, we have common definitions that are taught at schools like this around things like profit, depreciation, everything else. Um, and that's allowed the capital markets to scale. But when you think about the capital markets for impact investing, um, we need to complement those definitions of financial terms with those of social environmental. Um, now with Iris, we, it's an open platform, so any of you can use it. Uh, you can access it through our website. There's no barriers to usage at all. And we don't know, of, as a result, we don't know all the people who are using it at this point, but we do have data that's reported through a number of our uh, partners on uh, roughly 5,000 companies um, that are using it. And they vary dramatically in, in what they use. So they, some of them use just a few metrics, and some of them use a, a broad array of metrics to measure their performance. I think what we see in the market is that um, the majority of companies using it are profitable. Um, so there, there is, a, you know, this isn't necessarily companies that aren't seeking to have a strong financial performance. But there's an increasing sophistication with how people think about impact, which leads to an increasing sophistication with how they define it and measure it. And that's one of the things that we provide as a public good or a lot of education services to support both the enterprises and the investors. Um, did I get at your question? Yes, so, very good. Thank okay, sure, thanks. There's some questions at the back there, if you can get the mic there. <laughs> it's a long one. <laughs> we'll try to move from one part of the audience yeah. to the other, so if we can get the mic there. Good evening. Thank you for your uh, excellent presentation. My name is Owen Knippenberg. I'm an entrepreneur and facilitator in Li based in Liberia. And uh, my question is simply challenging one of your basic premises. Why entrepreneurs? If what you care about is impact investing, and as you said, social entrepreneurs are seeding the seeds of their own destruction by opening up new spaces for their competition, why not simply focus on that competition, on established private sector companies, and convince them that they have a moral and financial imperative to work in these sectors? After all, they do have the resources and the political sway necessary. A very good example of a successful enterprise that was launched that way is, as you said, M-Pesa.
So I think the thing there is all of us would like corporates to get into this space and actually work. But our experience, and we've studied quite a few of them, uh, in fact, there's an article in HPR, if you'd like to read, on companies at the bottom of the pyramid, there's a couple of factors going on. First of all, many of them are still driven by profits. And when you look at the profitability of a lot of these ventures, it's very uncertain in the beginning. So going in for something with a much longer time horizon, uncertain profitability is something most corporates find difficult to do. The second very pragmatic thing is corporates are used to doing what they do, the whole idea of core competencies. When you get into these spaces, the business model doesn't exist. You've got to go into something new. And most corporates are not comfortable doing that. So while I think all of us would like corporates to get in, practically we do not see them getting in. So the idea which I think Zia raised, and I'm going to turn it back to you, Zia, is the one where can we get innovators to come up with the ideas, and then can we get corporates to pick them up after some proof of concept? And maybe they don't have to be just disrupting them, but actually co-opt them and build off that. Yeah, love your well, I think that's a good point, and I guess the way I would see corporates is as a, uh, an avenue to scale. So a lot of people lump the private sector as one big you know, group of resources, but it's really helpful to separate out the impact investors and the financial investors who are providing capital, and corporates have an operational footprint that can be very helpful. So I think really powerful combinations um, that need to happen, and again, this is a role for industry facilitators, is to create more visibility for social entrepreneurs of the opportunities that corporates can offer and for social entrepreneurs to be the R&D arm for corporates understanding what their interests are. In many ways, this happens in Silicon Valley. A lot of entrepreneurs start with a target of being sold to Cisco because they know that Cisco is moving in a certain market or Google is moving in a certain market. We don't have those information flows in the social sector, and that's one of the market breakdowns uh, that we were alluding to earlier around what's the exit. And just to add, I think there's a lot of people who do believe that that is the path that a, well, is very, for a set of reasons that are well-researched, it's very hard for large corporates to innovate, largely because their opportunity cost is much higher. Um, so for them to spend time figuring out how to serve the bottom of the pyramid market, the opportunity cost is serving their middle or upper class markets, whereas an, an entrepreneur doesn't have that opportunity cost. So Outside a very constrained set of circumstances, there is, which happen to be perfectly applied in the mobile phone space. Um, we just can't expect the large corporates to start here. I think the other thing we've learned, and this goes back to the question around the timeline of facilitation, there have been quite a few successful entrepreneurs who have sought to prove to the mainstream markets that they were missing an opportunity and had a thesis that was we would demonstrate that the market is biased and missing the opportunity at which point we will build the bridges for those large corporates to take over and do what we've been doing. And one of my favorite organizations is named Root Capital. Uh, they're up in Boston. They've been lending for about 15 years to mostly pharma cooperatives around Africa and Latin America. They have a very, and they're a nonprofit, so they, have, they borrow money, but it's debt, not equity. And so they have the luxury of very intentionally seeking to put themselves out of business as the way to serve their mission. They have been surprised and disappointed about how long it has taken to induce the mainstream banks to do what they are doing, profitably lending to rural cooperatives, um, and had a particular experience in Rwanda where uh, the government stepped in and the government-run bank said, well, fine, you guys have proven to us that this is a viable market. We'll take over, which the hypothesis is supposed to be that's, that's victory. Uh, it turned out they weren't very good at it, and they pulled out within two years, and Root Capital is now back lending in Rwanda. But one of their learnings from 15 years of, of doing this, of trying to bring a market-based solution to scale is it takes much longer than you think it should, beyond the point at which you believe your pilot program has demonstrated to the mainstream markets that this is a viable market. Um, it turns out that for a lot of structural reasons, as well as, I would argue, ideological reasons, um, analysis doesn't necessarily lead to behavior change among large corporates as quickly as we would like to. Um, which sort of leads me to a question I'd love the panel, I don't know if I want to take away from other people, but at some point, one thing I was thinking about reading your report is, what is the exit for, for industry facilitators? Um, because I think that in a mature market with lots of competitors, you can exit to the trade association and leave the stu I don't think the stewardship of the ecosystem and the public goods ever ends. All of our big industries are constantly managing the government. They're managing the public goods around them. Um, but they're doing it through trade associations, which are paid for out of a share of the profits for the organization. So where do you think the exit is, not for the entrepreneur, but for the, the, the facilitator? And, and is there an exit? if you assert that some of these are going to be low margin businesses that can't necessarily pay for their own public goods. Yeah, do you have a perspective 
Um, I guess, Anthony, my thought there, other than having watched you exit the Rockefeller Foundation to your new job, <laughs> <laughs> um, is that there's a range of facilitators, and I think it's a handoff. So a lot of what we see our role as being is defining the problem in the first case and then framing it for different actors and finding what are the catalytic ways that we can you know, play a role to get it going. But we always see an exit role for us because if anything is dependent on grant funding, it's just not going to take off. Uh, so and I think I'm going you know, to be curious about your perspective, having been sort of one of the folks that the baton was handed to mm -hmm. and having a charge now of growing that and what you think, Jen, may have an exit strategy or not. So I guess I see it as a series of handoffs. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, for us, you know, we've, we've spent a lot of time thinking about this, at least in the context of the gin strategy, and I think it's a very interesting question because um, part of it um, gets to one of the points that Harvey made in his presentation, which is what is the, the timeline that you're thinking about for this, um, for kind of scaling this market? And for us, it's very much a long game. Uh, you know, so this uh, fits with one of his rules, I think it was the fifth one, of committing and adapting. Um, you know, so we have a long commitment to building the impact investment market, um, but we expect and plan to adapt significantly over time as the market evolves. Um, the market's in a very different place than when we were launched. Um, there's a lot more buzz and excitement around it now than there was a few years ago, um, and that's le led to a lot of um, doors being opened and a, a lot of exciting possibilities. Um, but we're still of the view right now, at least, that we have a long ways to go to reaching the pinnacle for this market. And so for us, it's still, in terms of our investment in public goods, that is only increasing at this moment. Um, and so I think for us, though, ultimately, um, we do have earned revenue streams from our, our membership component. And that essentially, you know, you could consider that part kind of like an industry association, but we do a lot more kind of facilitation work with those members than a, a classical association would do. Um, but that, that may continue to grow, but we still are spending a lot of time and, and resources on things like um, the research and, um, and the other public goods like IRIS that we were discussing earlier. So there may be a point at which um, those investments are no longer as necessary and that those may it's in themselves have sustainable business models as the market evolves and all the members and the, the community has more resources to contribute to the field building. Um, but I do think it is still very much a long game. And so I think when one thing that's very important, I think a lot of these lessons draw out, whether it's the, the tea industry in, in Kenya or the microfinance market in India, that it takes, you know, it's not kind of months or years, but in decades that we're thinking about this type of work. Thanks so much. There's a question back there, if you can get the mic there. Hi, uh, my name is Ben Midbury, and I'm part of the Deutsche Bank Global Social Investment Funds and a Columbia alum. Uh, I guess whoever on the panel can speak to this, could you provide some examples or strategies regarding affecting regulatory or policy change to remove barriers for social enterprises? Great. Yeah, again, I know you've done this in different places. Sure. Um, well, uh, I'll, I'll just sort of share a high level framing. Um, and then maybe talk a little bit, uh, and Anthony, we can pick it up maybe on our perspectives on this National Advisory Board uh, that we're on. So in general, policy change, I think you can think of it as an inside approach or an outside approach. And one has to do more with sort of targeting specific legislators, understanding their interests, and providing them with the research they need or leaning on them in certain ways. And the other is to create more of a mass movement around what is important and uh, creating some appeal to people for how that needs to change. And I think if you were to watch the changes of um, attitudes and policy on gay marriage, you'd see evidence of both. Uh, you know, the role that television and the media played uh, in creating the social acceptability of it. And then there was a lot of very interesting behind the scenes um, politicking happening inside the legislators. If you were to translate that to impact investing, this is something um, that uh, both uh, uh, several of us have been involved with, which is the uh, US National Advisory Board to come up with specific policy recommendations that we're wrestling with right now, which is how can we create maybe more awareness and pressure among the institutional investors to make the asks and make the requests of the government in order to enable their 
impact investing uh, and make it easier. So for example, on foundations, it'd be very helpful to liberalize the rules on program related investments, for example, while at the same time trying to find who might be those legislators who could be champions, maybe because impact investing can really unlock potential for an issue they care about in their constituency, be it education, be it jobs, or whatever the case may be. So there's no easy answer to that, but that's sort of a way to think about it. I think there's been some pretty sophisticated thinking that's been done. Um, there's a group called PCV Insight out of California that's with Rockefeller funding has done a lot of work around a policy framework globally, also applied it here. I think there's some pretty traditional things that um, government can be expected to do. One is just around removing barriers. Um, one of the problems is that this work exists in a world in which most politicians, as most investors, still believe that the, the only morally legitimate way to solve social problems is through government and charity that the only purpose of, of business and investing is making money. And we have a whole regulatory framework around the world that's built around those two pillars. So partly what you're doing is you're trying to remove some of the constraints. I mean, Root Capital is a nonprofit, but they borrow money. Uh, should you get a tax break for lending to them? Well, you should if it's charitable purpose, but we don't have that sort of sense in our regulation. So I think one of the most important regulatory changes that's happened, certainly around the, the part that I know best, which is the financing of these kinds of enterprises, um, has been governments around the world that have compelled their banks to unlock some of their money for this kind of enterprise. And in India, there's a very important regulation that mandates banks to invest a certain amount of money in designated areas. The same rule exists in the US. The US community finance industry is completely a child, I believe, of a set of regulations that have compelled the banks to lend to poor in poor communities, which they don't want to do. And so they have basically induced the creation of an entire system of intermediaries who, who do this. So we are a scaled market-based solution largely because of regulation. So I think government can unlock barriers. Government can also have play a very interesting role around certification. Um, Ahmed mentioned one of the most profoundly important public goods in capitalism is common accounting standards. Sounds really wonky and bizarre, but the scaling of investment practice is hugely contingent on there being a set of accounting standards that we all agree on so that we can compare one investment to another. The government played a central role in that. I don't know if you know this, but gap accounting standards are not a government law. They are an independent creation of the Accounting Trade Association in the early 20th century. But the crucial role of government was to step in and say, this is the standard we are going to certify, even though it is still to this day held by a private association of accountants. So I think there's a very interesting role governments can play around certification convening. In my experience, most of what we and players in this space go to government for is subsidy. Um, and even if you start with a more comprehensive set of what you need, it is very easy to, to focus on we need money, um, which makes a lot of these marginal business models survive, but in the end is probably not the kind of transformative systemic change that we really need. There's a question in the front there. I've been facilitating community economic development since 1975, so um, there is a career. There is a succession, just trust fate. Um, the question is about bankruptcy in the regulatory environment. Um, I, I guess over 40 years I've come to really appreciate that a, a, uh, a um, I want to say a beneficial bankruptcy regime is absolutely critical to an entrepreneurial environment. And as we look around the world, I wonder what your observations are with regard to that. Yeah, um, so we, we often hear about the great benefit of capitalism. It's Darwinian and it allocates resources to the winners and the losers die. And that's, you know, the fish eat the sharks and all that. Um, it's all true. And I think bankruptcy is an incredibly powerful force for productivity and efficiency, the huge danger in our field is that if Starbucks goes out of business, then Pete's Coffee is going to move in next week and you're still going to get your coffee. Um, if that organization providing clean water in the village in India goes out of business, there's no reason necessary to believe that there is going to be a competitor moving in and providing that service. And so I get very nervous when people talk about bankruptcy or just Darwinian market forces as an inherently good thing without being sensitive to the incredibly important human dimension of the work we do. I mean, we are here because we are not just talking about growing businesses. We're talking about solving social problems through business. And I agree with you that a healthy sense that bankruptcy is not an, a stigma that needs to be avoided at all costs does spur a lot of entrepreneurial risk taking, which is absolutely essential in this space. Uh, at the same time, we have to be very careful about 
how do we consider the preservation of the mission in the context of the bankruptcy of the business? Um, and that's something that is just, I think, incredibly important when it is not regarded. At the same time, though, when it is overly regarded and we keep too many poorly functioning, bankrupting businesses going because we're able to subsidize them because we're so compelled by the mission, um, we can really create damage on both sides. Yeah. I think it's, um, it's, it's a really interesting question for the, the impact of investment market because um, you know, particularly with a lot of uh, you know, and members who engage in venture capital, which usually has a high appetite for risk. Um, and, and that's definitional uh, for that for that asset class. And I think one of our members, um, you know, put it, um, you know, put it very well when he had, he had been a, um, an experienced venture capitalist, you know, doing kind of a, not before he was an impact investor, um, had, and in his words, had made a lot of money, been very successful um, by all accounts. But when he looked back at all of his you know, collective portfolios, none of those companies existed today. Um, but now that he's engaged as an impact vest investor, he said he would be incredibly uncomfortable if that was kind of the fruits of his labor uh, two decades from now. And so it's an interesting thing that, um, uh, that you know, just to build on Auntie's point, of that ultimately if you're engaging in business, some of them aren't going to fail. Um, and there is some risk that you need to take on that's fundamental to investing. Um, if there isn't risk, there, sh there shouldn't be much of an upside to be made. Um, but at the same time, um, a lot of the people who are engaged in this market, including very savvy investors like him, are fundamentally uncomfortable with the notion that all these businesses that they care so much about and are putting so much into may not end up being successful. And I think it's something that, as a field, we're still uh, reconciling. Last question. Hi, my name is Nicole. I am a 2012 Columbia graduate, and I run a social enterprise that does credit scoring with mobile data in developing countries. And I know a bunch of people, in particular in East Africa, who run social enterprises or just enterprises that could or may decide not to brand themselves as social, but who have gotten very sort of frustrated about the due diligence process with impact investors and decided to go for venture capital instead. And I just wanted to hear thoughts from any of you on that choice. Obviously, there are some major pitfalls that could happen, but to the extent that there are lots of VCs and angel investors who've worked in emerging markets now and kind of understand the potholes and power outages, you know, maybe maybe that's enough. What do you think? Amit, I think that's great. In sure. Um, well, I certainly can't speak to the experience of your colleagues, but I think it's, um, I mean, one of the things that's that actually, um, you in many ways, precipitated the gin, like the development of the gin, um, was a recognition that there were a lot of entrepreneurs out there, um, you know, who had a social or environmental mission, um, and lacked an opportunity to get investors who were aligned with their mission, um, and the inherent tensions that came from that. And so, I think, in large part, the support of the impact investment community was you know, designed to create a community of investors who were also thinking about how to support the mission of these entrepreneurs. Um, we have found, I can't speak to the specific kind of, um, you know, um, you know uh, experiences of going through due diligence with whichever investors they engaged in, uh, and I'm sure there are some that are um, you know, very rigorous and some that aren't rigorous enough uh, in this market, as you'd find in any. But I think one of the things that we have seen in a number of markets is, a, is now a blending of capital from impact investors and more commercial investors. Um, I do think that in one sense people will declare victory, um, that it's we're getting commercial investment capital into these businesses. But I do think that one thing that is, um, you know, that we'll have to contend with as a field is what are the potential conflicts that emerge from that? Um, and as, as Ashish kind of raised with the, with the question of corporates, I'm um, moving into some of these areas, um, you know, there are, you know, sometimes there will be a path of least resistance that leads you away from serving the poor or your, your mission, and that we've seen that in many, people call it mission drift, and people have seen that in many uh, markets. And I think, um, I mean, to the extent that they found investors who support them for the core focus of their mission, um, I think it's great. Um, it doesn't, they don't necessarily have to have the label of an impact investor to be supportive of it. Um, but I do think what's critical um, for your colleagues to, to determine is if they're finding investors um, who back the business for all the reasons that they're um, personally committed to running it. Um, because that's an area where a great degree of tension and, and kind of uh, divergence can be very painful uh, for a very ambitious and motivated entrepreneur. Thanks, Abit. In fact, we've ourselves experienced that through quite a few of our interactions. You get in an initial investor who's socially driven, and then you get in somebody who's completely commercially driven, and what happens at the boardroom is not fun. Yeah. Now, what I'm going to actually ask is we can go on for questions forever. I'm going to ask each of the panelists to give one last thought as they sort of reflect back on the evening. I'm going to start with Rita. It'd be great to get your thoughts. Okay. 
Thanks, Ashish. Um, I think there's a lot of expertise in this room, and I, for one, would love to hear more, because I think the questions point to all of you having a lot of experience and expertise in this area. So we will be having a reception after this evening, and I look forward to talking with all of you and learning more, as well as talking to these panelists, who each brings a different perspective, which I think has been really interesting for me to hear. Zia? I guess the final comment I would have is, um, uh, this has been a great discussion, so thank you all to my panelists and also the audience. There has been such a trend because it felt new to think about driving social change as a business. I think that metaphor can only be pushed so far. And so, you know, there's a little bit of a holy grail around if we have the right metrics, we just plug it into our financial management system and we'll be able to get social impact the same way we get profit. And so I think what we're at now is a new maturity level where we have to think about, um, you know, not only how do we make social change feel more like a business, but how do we get business to feel more like how people who drive social change and find more of a middle ground and an integration of the practices rather than presuming that business is the way to get things done. Thank you. Um, Amit? Sure. Um, I, well, one, congrats on the report, and thank you all for joining us. I think the, um, uh, just to build on Zia's comment, I think what's, um, there's a lot of experience in this room, and I think people are, are playing different roles in this market. Um, or aspiring to uh, soon. And I think what's important for all of um, us to ask ourselves is, you know, what is the role that we play in the relations that we have to the broader field that we're developing? Uh, so regardless of the, you know, the, the industry that you're in, um, whether you're a funder or an enterprise, um, but how do you want to work with your competitors? How do you work with, want to work with industry facilitators? Or how do you want to be an industry facilitator? Um, because I think this lens of building markets as opposed to building just businesses is really important. Uh, and I think the conventional private markets in many ways figure this out. You see an industry associations advancing the interests of uh, any range of industries uh, here in the U.S. and abroad. Um, but it's one area where we can get more sophisticated as a field. And so um, you know, I really appreciate the dialogue today and hope to continue to be a part of it. Yeah, just I mean, the last thing is, again, thank you, everyone, for your attention. It's quite remarkable. And I do think it's an amazing opportunity to be engaged in a conversation like this. I was handed recently a business card someone had that said impact investor is their job title. And they said, you know, I wrote my thesis on impact investing, which is, I'm not that old, but I'm old enough to know that that is not something you could have even contemplated 10 years ago. And I think the world was simpler uh, when we really thought that the only way to solve social problems was through charity and government. And the only role of business was to make money. Uh, it's hard enough to make money. But as I say to my students in Columbia, as hard as the professors out there will make you think it is to do business, this is where you really have to put your thinking caps on. And I think partly what we've identified in this is you have to be so much more nuanced, not just in your thinking and your analysis, but in your sensitivity and your understanding of anthropology and politics and sociology. And I think what's so exciting and, and challenging about this work is it really requires you to be you know, using your, your thoughts. I mean, this conversation on what is the role of com competition versus collaboration, you'll, you'll talk about that in your competitive strategy classes when it comes to, you know, buying and selling widgets. But when you're talking about doing that in the context of providing essential services to highly politicized communities, um, it's just fascinating. So I, you know, all I can say is, if you choose this work, it's an incredible blessing. And it's also, uh, it's going to be a really tough ride. And you're going to have to think harder than you would in anything else you do. Um, but it's, you know, we don't have the answers. But it's, a, it's an amazing thing that we're all going to be figuring out over the next generation or two together. Thank you, Anthony. I'd like to thank all the panelists. It's been fascinating having all of you here. I think the diverse backgrounds you bring to the table have really shown up in the discussion. And I want to thank all of you for being here. Thank you. Thank you.